Shell Major Chevron has announced that it's going to be taking a charge of at least $10 billion this quarter to write down the value of some of its assets. This is all related to what they think is going to be lower commodity prices as the industry deals with the supply glut. Joining us right now is Chevron CEO Michael Wirth. Michael, it's great to see you today. Good morning, Becky. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this. You, you took a look at the assets and then decided as a company where you think oil prices are headed from here. And, 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 and what did you come up with that assessment? Well, bi business is good. Uh, we're leading our peers in total shareholder return this year. We've seen record production and free cash flow is growing. But good isn't good enough. So we're setting the standard higher for ourselves. We're streamlining our operational footprint. We're harnessing technology to drive efficiencies in our business. And we're simplifying our organization to get the right people on the right work, all of which are actions that will deliver even better results. The assets that you're writing down, tell us a little bit about them. These are shale assets. I think Appalachia is a big part of them. But talk a little bit about why you look at that and think that this is an area you, you need to write down. Well, we regularly take a look at our long-term outlook for commodity markets. And as we do that, uh, we also look at our assets. And uh, we evaluate which assets will deliver the highest returns uh, on investment for our shareholders. We've got a great portfolio of things to invest in. And uh, the assets in the northeastern U.S., along with some in Canada and other parts of the world, simply don't compete as well for our investment dollar as others do. We're staying very committed to capital discipline. This is the third year in a row where we've held capital spending flat. So we have to make tough choices to high grade those uh, projects that we'll invest in. And some of our assets may work better for others. You know, it, it's interesting. There's a, a lot there. You're talking about flat capital expenditures. It's, it's a big number, though, $20 billion. $20 billion is a big number. And so it's important that we spend every dollar to uh, generate strong results. Uh, if you go back uh, about five years ago, we were actually spending $40 billion. So we've brought our spending down as commodity markets have reset. And uh, I like to tell our people in a commodity business, capital discipline always matters and cost discipline always matters. And we intend to make the hard choices to continue to deliver leading performance. How have your production numbers held up in this time period where you've, you've kept it flat for three years and come down substantially from where you were five years ago? We've seen growth every single year for the last uh, the last three years. Uh, we're showing a three to four percent growth again this year, uh, year to date, and so we've seen good, strong growth as we have opportunities to invest in projects that are highly economic. We've talked before about the Permian Basin here in the U.S., which is really the story driving a global uh, supply growth. Uh, so our production has grown and our cash flow has grown. So let's just focus on that. You're looking at places where you think you can spend less money and it's easier to get the oil out of the ground, and you think those are the assets that you'd like to double down on or maybe potentially buy additional ones there, get rid of some of these ones that are a little more difficult? Well, that's certainly part of the equation. The real uh, focus for us is on delivering strong returns, and, uh, and so the, the projects that have low investment costs, we can get uh, products to market and, uh, and deliver strong returns to our investors are the ones we're focusing on. The other thing that the shale has, which is nice, is it's a shorter cycle. So uh, roughly two-thirds of our spending delivers cash flow within two years. And that allows us to adjust capital spending to markets if we need to. So we've got uh, a budget that allows us to adjust. We've got the lowest break-even price to cover our dividend among our major peers and the strongest balance sheet. So that puts us, puts us in a very strong position financially to continue to support uh, cash distributions to our shareholders. In, in a world where, Mike, where it's Joe Kernan, in a world where we thought, you know, we were eventually going to run out, this is a good problem to have, though. I mean, the, the, you could get this stuff out of the ground if you wanted at the right price, right? The, the stuff that, that you may not want to do that just for shareholder return, it might not be good. What, what price would you need uh, oil to be to, to, for, to not be taking this right down and, and to go ahead and develop it? Well, these are these are primarily gas-oriented assets, yes, but I think okay. the, broader, the, the broader story here is uh, there's an abundance of resource in the world. We're not running out. Innovation and technology have allowed us to meet the world's demand, and it's a growing demand for energy in an even more efficient manner. And so we can do this at lower costs, which is good for economies, it's good for consumers, particularly in developing countries yeah. around the world. But well, we could always go back and get it, couldn't we, if, if it's... At some kind sure, of cost. It's, yeah, it's at, at, a, at a certain cost. Did your, uh, 
you know, they, they, you're a chemical engineer from a great engineering department at CU, by the way, the Buffaloes. But uh, did, did, did that help you decide? I mean, some of these things that you do, I think, I, I think chemical engineers should, should be hired for just about everything uh, because that's hard. You, you got to go to school for that and you got to actually work. Well, that's, uh, that's a few years ago. Uh, it, was a, it was a demanding uh, curriculum. And yeah. uh, we've got, look, we've got lots of smart engineers of all different types in our business, and uh, they're essential to. Uh, to, to, to drive the innovation that is uh, really continuing to fuel, I think, this uh, uh, benefit to the U.S. economy and the global economy. Do you think that the ways. Aramco needs to write anything down? Well, I, you know, I don't know uh, the details of Aramco's business. They've certainly been in the news a lot lately. They're a great company with great people, and we've got a long history. Well, Michael, I, I imagine them. you've been watching this IPO process just in terms of looking at valuations, looking at different assets. Um, you know, I think we're all trying to figure out what to take away from this whole process on the valuation side and then also on this sort of larger question about whether a company like that can ultimately land up on an exchange like the New York Stock Exchange or in London and how that might change some of these valuations and how that might even impact a company like your own. Well, I think it's very early to speculate on that. This is a relatively small portion of their company. Uh, that they've made public. And of course, we've seen this in other state-owned uh, companies in our industry in places like China, historically, where they've uh, become publicly listed. And I think it's a gradual process that unfolds and markets uh, adjust to the information and the opportunities. And so this will play out over a period of time. And I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just have to watch how that, uh, how that plays out. Hey, Michael, you, you made the point that you're in a good position right now. The company has good times and good things that are happening. It is an unusual way to kind of go about a reorganization at something like that. Uh, but it's probably the smart play to do. I've also seen, though, you make the point that you're doing this uh, because you don't want to wait for oil and gas prices to rise. If you look out for a long time, do you actually think oil and gas prices could rise down the road? Or are we really in a secular change where this is a big glut for all sorts of oil and gas, and we're kind of awash in it around the globe, and, and you're not anticipating that we will see prices rise anytime soon, significantly. Well, commodity markets are, are difficult to predict, and if I could project oil price uh, accurately, I might be doing something else for a living. And so we, <laughs> we try not to uh, build our business on a, a hope that prices will rise, but rather to take a look at the things we can control, which are the capital choices we make, uh, our costs, the way we invest in technology and efficiency, and be prepared to compete in any environment. And certainly today, we see a world that's well supplied with both oil and gas, and it looks that way for a period of time. But the long history of the industry is one of cycles, and uh, we need to be prepared for the market we see today. And if there's upside, uh, we certainly will perform even better, and uh, we've got a history of sharing that cash flow with our, with our shareholders. And so... Uh, that's, I think, the responsible way to run our business. For years, uh, Mike, the, the hydrocarbon industry has been pressured to, to try to transition away from, from your bread and butter and, into renewables. And you know, I'm glad you didn't do it 10, 15 years ago because you, the shareholder return wouldn't, I don't know what it would be at this point. But do you feel uh, uh, a responsibility as CEO to start transitioning, uh, to start the company on a path? to some, something like wind or solar or I don't know where you'd want to go, but do, do you feel you should be doing that now to, to, for the future and uh, for all the ESG funds that might end up investing in Chevron if you were to do that? Joe, our company's been around for 140 years, and the story of that entire history is affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner energy production to meet society's needs. And so as we move forward, uh, we intend to continue to do that. Uh, that means that we'll produce the types of energy the world demands today, but we'll also look to reduce the environmental footprint of ours through uh, our own uh, carbon uh, intensity of our operations. We yeah. look to integrate renewables into our business where it makes economic sense. And we're investing in technologies that hold the prospect to provide breakthroughs for the future. Yeah. So we do all of those things as we still invest to, uh, to meet the, the needs of the world today. And, of course... We have to be a strong, viable entity uh, in, order to, uh, in order to play that role yeah, long keep, into the future. Keep, keep drilling, Mike. I, I'm sure the time person of the year might not like you very much or that answer you just gave. But, uh, I, you know, just uh, let's not go full, full bore into, you know, keep, keep, 
Uh, pump in the oil, please. Thanks. Hey, Mike, one more quick question for you. You did mention how you've outperformed your peers, and you have pretty substantially, both for year to date and the last five years on a rolling average, but you've underperformed the S&P in both those instances. This is something that's plagued all the oil and gas companies. Why should investors put money into an oil and gas company at this point? Well, you're right. We have been out of favor in the, uh, in the broader markets, uh, which is one reason why we're, we're relying on self-help to improve. I think the, the most compelling metric to look at is free cash flow yield. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the cash flow that we're generating right now uh, as a company, our free cash flow yield is higher than any other sector in the S&P 500. So I think there's a real value opportunity there that investors will, uh, will begin to recognize.